Hello and thank you for watching this OncLive Peer Exchange. This program will feature an international panel of experts who will discuss the latest research on the treatment and management of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, including the studies presented at ASCO 2015. We'll talk about how the newest data pertains to your patients and how to use it in everyday practice. My name is Dr. John Marshall, and I'm a professor and the chief of the division at hematology and oncology at Georgetown University, and I'm the director of the Roosh Center for the Cure of GI Cancers at Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center in Washington, D.C. Joining me today is really a fabulous couple of guys. They just know everything about colorectal cancer, and I can't believe they were able to come and join us. Dr. Dirk Arnold, medical oncologist and professor and head of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology for Clinical Research and Palliative Care at the Tumor Biology Center in Germany. Dirk. Welcome. Thanks. And Pleasure. to my other side, my, uh, Dr. Fortunato Cirdello, full professor of medical oncology of the Department of Medicine and Surgery and Experimental Therapeutics at the Second University of Naples in Italy. Fortunato, thanks for being here. Thank you, John. All right, so we're just going to dive into this because a lot is happening in colorectal cancer. Yes, some new medicines, some new molecular information, really some improved understanding about how we go forward. Fortunato, you get the stick first. Tell us a little bit about molecular testing for colon cancer today. What should we be doing? What's it mean um, for our therapeutics and decision making today? Start there. You know, colorectal cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. Now we know since at least 10 years that we had novel techniques that could be comprehensively uh, searching for mutations, gene alteration, gene expression profiles at a very extensive level. We know that patients with the same type of tumor actually have different cancers in terms of molecular alterations. How we use this information in terms of prognostic indications, in terms of predictive factors for selecting specific therapies in terms of personalization of treatment is still a major question mark. Mm -hmm. So actually we have a lot of information about tumors that have, for example, uh, and different in terms of number of mutations, for example, tumors that, that have a mismatch repair mechanism and accumulate more mutations. Some of these tumors maybe have a, a different prognostic uh, um, role or uh, a different prognosis if you compare to those that are more stable in uh, gene alterations. And another important issue is that tumors that are hypermutated may be accumulate new antigens. And so, for example, here at ASCO will be presented data showing clearly that in these tumors with the more neoantigens formed, there is much more infiltrate of cells that uh, belongs to the immune system. Is this a prognostic factor telling us that these tumors can be better uh, known and so in this way the, uh, the host, the patient, could fight against them? Or, for example, this is a place for immunotherapy intervention. Yeah. So these are questions that we have still to get answers. And I'm sure that we're excited the next two or three years with specific clinical trials, yeah. we can have more information. Going to the reality, yeah. the everyday life today, basically the most important genetic testing for dictating or for helping us to define which is the best treatment in metastatic disease is RAS gene mutations. Now we understand that about 50 to 60 percent of colorectal cancer patients with metastatic disease harbor in their tumor a mutation in either K or N RAS genes. These mutations occur in specific hotspots in which by single nucleotide change and single amino acid change the protein is constitutively active. And so if we block upstream signaling, such as the EGFR, this will not work. So basically, this has been the base for selecting out those patients who will never be able to benefit with anti-GFR therapy treatment. Yeah. We know also, for example, BRAF can add more information, at least in the metastatic setting. Usually, BRAF mutated tumor is uh, maybe the worst prognostic group that can be defined by a single mutation or by a single uh, prognostic factor. Maybe and so far, right? So far. <laughs> and so far, we are still looking at which is the best therapy for this. Looks like that EGFR inhibitors by themselves are not the right answer, or maybe can be combined with other um, inhibitors of the pathway, or for example, an extensive chemotherapy plus uh, antiangiogenic drugs could be the right choice. We don't know yet. So let's break that down. You just gave us the, the beginning and the end. So the testing, You're, you've mentioned MS, mm -hmm. mismatch repair, uh, the RAS, BRAF mm -hmm. pathways. 
technically, Dirk, how is this happening in your practice? How are you, when are you getting this testing? How are you using it in day-to-day -day practice today in yeah. metastatic disease? Yeah, um, good question because from the European perspective, we know that we have to have the information before we make up our treatment decision because we know that anti-EGF receptor treatment only work when we can ensure that the patient has a rough, uh, rough wild type. So meaning the testing is fairly a standard for all patients with metastatic disease before we start in treatment. And generally we get the results from the testing within four to five days. So meaning we do, do, do have- Do you do that in-house? Is it done well, in your center or are you sending the academic, it out? The academic centers do the, themselves smaller sites uh, distributed to, to um, well, let's say a central pathology institute. But also there is a, let's say broad network which ensures high quality and also an accurate testing within a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, John, if I can add yeah. something on that. In Europe, of course, countries are different from each other. Yeah. For example, the, I guess the most organized country in this sense, not only for RAS mutation, but all, for all other mutations is France, in which they have designated the 28 centers that are public comprehensive cancer centers in which molecular pathology is done for a particular region of the country. So this speeds up the results and ensure a better quality control. Because the key issue for all these biomarkers that are potentially used to define a therapy before we treat a patient, so we should have a, a biomarker uh, result that should be reliable, is quality control. Yeah. So in Europe, there's been a lot of work done by the European Society of Pathology and the European Society for Medical Oncology together to try to establish uh, schemes for external quality control, not only for RAS testing, but for all the diseases in which uh, genetic testing is important to select or stratify for patient treatment. Yeah, I know this is kind of a basic thought, but that we take a ball of cancer, we grind it up, and then we do gene testing to see if there's even a single copy. We can find uh, a copy of a mutation. I don't really know that we have a standard for copy number or frequency of mutation. And I know we talk a lot about the heterogeneity of tumors, that they're clones and subclones. So testing, uh, is this done on primaries, on METs? Uh, do you do more than one sample? Do you do repeat testing as lines of therapy go along? Or is this one and done? If the patient has a mutation, they always have a mutation. Well, this uh, depends whether you have a scientific regard to it or a standard practice regard. The standard practice says, well, it doesn't matter whether you take it from the primary tumor or the metastases because this mutation, if it occurs, it occurs very early in untreated patients. So most centers take the primary tumor, the, the material from the primary tumor and do the analysis. However, <clears throat> scientifically, it is highly interesting to see whether mutations evolve during treatment and meaning if patients are treated with specific uh, drugs like anti-EGF receptor antibodies, it is of high interest to look whether these mutations occur during treatment and also not only to look by rebiopsying the tumor, so the scientific interest is mainly on the circulating DNA or the plasma DNA um, to see whether mutation or mutational profile uh, changes or occurs here, and this is... Yeah, but you know, the breast cancer people, they, their standard practice is yeah. to rebiopsy to look for HER2 changes um, because there may be some differences in primary. You know, I, you know, we say a lot of things like you just said that, well, the primary reflects it, but frankly, in my experience, the more we're doing serial testing, the more we're getting unusual, no, the, surprising this is, this answers. Is, this is true. The major problem is uh, uh, what happens when you treat a patient and then the patient relapse? Can you mm. predict relapse before by looking at the appearance mm. or by the selection of clones that have a mutation? Because ideally you have two situations, maybe both of them are true. One is that one out of 100 million of cancer cells at the beginning have a mutation, you are just selecting out these cells when you treat with the anti-GF pharmacological antibody. Or under the pressure of the treatment, some cancer cells develop a mutation. What is interesting that was recently published uh, in nature just a few weeks ago is that this is a dynamic process. So when you stop treatment with the EGFR inhibitor by using plasma sampling serially done, you see that the mutation in the RAS pathway that appear before um, resistance occurs clinically then tend to disappear. It's like the cancer cells are so smart they tend to adapt mm. to what we are doing. And basically, this is another major problem we have, not only with EGFR inhibitors, but with every molecular target agents, because 
The risk is the cancer cells are always so smart to find the escape mechanism as to adapt in a plastic way themselves to what we are doing as therapy that eventually is always difficult to yeah. treat the patient efficiently. Let me get your reaction to this because, you know, we all learned that cancer was clonal, that the ball of cancer was all the same sort of cell and they sort of mm. change over time. You know, we do have some studies where multiple, you know, biopsies were taken from a single ball of tumor mm -hmm. and we're getting different gene profiles. So my way of thinking about colon cancer lately is that it's less like a lawn of grass that sort of changes and it's more like a forest of different mm -hmm. kinds of trees. Yeah. They're all trees. Right. Some are pine trees, some are oak trees, some, you know. And so our drugs kill yeah. one group yeah. of trees yeah. and the yeah. other becomes, is yeah. that the way it's feeling <laughs> like to you? I, I exactly have this feeling, so mm -hmm. I would 100% subscribe it and say, well, we see a clonal, let's say, selection. Some of them are growing, some of them are shrinking and this also makes sense to reconsider the reuse of drugs mm -hmm. which have been used before. We know this for anti-EGF receptor antibody, but we also know this for simple chemotherapy, yeah. for oxaliplatin. It works yeah, yeah. nicely if we reuse that at a later yeah. stage of being. The same drug can work again if this specific clone is regrowing. And yeah. then in a disease which is in most patients that relatively indolent as colorectal cancer, we can bit play around in many patients with induction, reinduction uh, mm. of these treatments. Mm. And therefore, this tumor, the tumor type of colorectal cancer helps us to understand what is behind that. You know, the idea of uh, having a cancer cell that was uh, recapitulating everything in these clonal cells maybe is too simplistic for uh, a solid tumor like colorectal yeah. cancer. So we can, obviously, uh, the paradigm is that the first clone is a single cancer cell, but then yeah. evolves in a forest yeah. Yeah. very quickly, yeah. uh, and there is a, like a spreading of the yeah. forest very quickly, yeah. and the forest is dynamic. Some mm -hmm. trees are right. dying because you are using a rhinotecan, and then under the pressure of oxaliplatin, yeah. uh, these trees are growing again, yeah. and then, yeah. you know, this applies for every drug. The amazing thing is that if we think about 5-FU or derivatives <laughs> of for a <laughs> we basically use them throughout. It's like, yeah. A little inhibition of uh, pyrimidines is always necessary. Always good. It's always good and always necessary. So let me pin you down.